Ten years ago, my wife and I learned that the child she was carrying showed signs of a serious genetic disorder. It was a very difficult time for us, and we felt powerless. And I was frustrated by the lack of knowledge there was about the causes of genetic disease and the lack of treatments. But as a scientist and an engineer, I wondered if I could understand what had happened to the DNA and maybe even change it. Could I think of cells as predictable machines? Could I understand DNA using the tools that I'm familiar with, mathematics and logic? Deciphering the way in which DNA encodes life became my passion. Now, every cell in your body contains a copy of your personal genome, or DNA. It's made up of the letters A, C, G, and T, strung together in a long chain, like the text of a book. The human genome contains three billion letters. So if you were to print it out, it would take up an entire wall of books. On the screen, I'm showing you a copy, a small, very small copy, of a piece of text that we have in our shared genome. One or two letters might be different in your personal copy, but that's about it. Small differences in the text of the genome account for differences that we have between us, whether you're slender or more intelligent or have cancer. Also, differences in the text of the genome account for different species. Amazingly, if you take the human genome and put it in a mouse cell, the mouse cell behaves like a human cell. Think about that. Now, when scientists first transcribed the text of the genome, they thought of it as being a big list of genes. One gene encodes color receptors in your eyes. Another gene stores fat. Another gene wires together neurons in your brain, enabling you to think. Genes are stored in the genome in a very simple way, as a string of characters, like a word. Here's an example. Now, scientists used to think of the genome as being packed full of genes, and diversity was about which genes you have. But recently, we've discovered this way of thinking is wrong. For example, you'd think that your genes would be different, say, than the genes of a dog. But they're not. They're nearly identical. Also, since genes are important, surely they take up a lot of the genome. But they don't. They take up only 1%, a tiny fraction. And third, many diseases are caused by typographical errors in the genome when one letter gets switched with another. Surely those occur in genes. Well, increasingly, we're finding out that they don't. They occur in the other 99%, the unchartered territory. So what's going on? The key is that different cells can do very different things with the same genes, depending on circumstances. All right, so a liver cell reads the genome differently than a brain cell. It's a good thing, or we'd be made entirely out of liver. <laughs> I like to think of it this way. The genome is not just any kind of book. It's a recipe book. It contains recipes for how to combine genes together in different ways to do different things. So let's think of genes as ingredients in a recipe. I've highlighted a few examples here. <laughs> so we have flour and butter, baking soda, and so on. Now, in a recipe, what's the most important thing? The instructions. The instruction tells you how to combine the ingredients. Here are some examples of instructions. So the flour is combined with butter, and it's mixed until crumbly. It's very important. You need to know to mix it until the mixture is crumbly. If you're making scones, then you'll add baking soda. But otherwise, you don't. That's also important. So the recipe brings the ingredients to life. So when we're trying to find these recipes in the genome, of course, we're not dealing with English language and, and baking recipes, right? We're dealing with a much more difficult problem. So how do we find these recipes? Well, we found out where the genes are located in the genome several years ago. We knew that. But the recipes are hidden, and they're also complex. So finding the recipes is very difficult. And it's actually the main challenge for myself and my colleagues today. To do it, we compare the text of the genome with what's going on in different cells, and we look for patterns. Okay, it's like comparing the text of a recipe book with different baked products that a chef has prepared. So coming back to our example, here's some actual instructions that my students and I have found. It's interesting that the instructions take up more of the genome than the gene itself. And of course, the instructions are written in the language of DNA, which we're learning how to interpret. 
Now, where is this going to take us? What will be the future? Let me give you a glimpse of what is to come. Soon, we'll decode the recipes in the genome. We'll figure out the genetic causes of diversity and even disease. And we'll be faced with the possibility of modifying ourselves genetically. Let's come back to our example. It turns out that once in a while, a baby is born with errors in the four letters shown here, in yellow. And when that occurs, the baby develops a disease called spinal muscular atrophy. It's a leading cause of death, in North, of infant mortality in North America. Now, it's interesting, if you look at what's going on, that these errors occur in the instructions, not in the gene itself. So deciphering these recipes is important. Now, here's what we can do. We can design genetic patches that overlay the instructions and make the gene work again. We can treat the disease. Sometimes we're successful, and sometimes we're not. So it's not a perfect science yet. Now, where will this take us? In my personal circumstances, these discoveries were made too late to be helpful. But I know that many parents, some in this room perhaps, are dealing with a, a similar situation and have to make difficult choices. And many of them will want this technology. But where will it take us as a society? Where will this lead? Should we pursue this possibility? Some people may be fearful. Well, let me tell you about a story. When I was a child, my grandmother would visit on Sunday mornings and read storybooks to me. And my favorite book of stories was about witches and their strange, mysterious lives. And the stories frightened me a lot. They even gave me nightmares. But I was just so curious, I couldn't help but ask her to read those stories again and again. So I think we don't have a choice. One day, we will modify our genomes so as to design ourselves and our children. Because as humans, our curiosity is stronger than our fear. Thank you.